Welcome to the final installment of a three-part session on the Philippine dress. Last time, we stopped in the late 1930s Commonwealth period. We begin this session at the start of World War II. Our objectives for session three are the following. Familiarization with Philippine dress history from the 1940s to the 1960s. Identification of some variations of the Philippine dress and an appreciation of Filipino design. The basic terms which include other variations of the Philippine dress are the following. Traje de Mestiza, outfit of the half Spanish or half Chinese female, comprised of a camisa, panuelo, saya, and tapis. Terno, before World War II, meant a matching set of garments comprised of a camisa, panuelo, saya, and sobre falda. Terno, after World War II, was a dress with butterfly sleeves. The kimona was a translucent short blouse with slightly extended shoulders. Balintawak was the country version of the terno with an alampay. Filipiniana attire was a term that encompasses all Philippine costumes, including those inspired by indigenous clothing and those using local materials. The early 1940s. As nations prepared to go to war, frivolities and luxuries were first set aside, and this had a profound effect on clothing. In the early 1940s, essential supplies became scarce, and items like textiles were being rationed. This resulted in a need to simplify clothing in the early 1940s, which was characterized by utilitarian wear. These practical clothes, which also appeared with boxy shoulders, required less fabrics and were easier to manufacture. In the Philippines, the one-piece terno, a continuous garment without a separate camisa, was made possible by the introduction of the zipper in the 1930s. Here we see a seated Aurora Quezon in the dominant silhouette of the early 1940s, which was a one-piece terno. As social events disappeared in the Philippines, a simple flared skirt replaced the saya de cola. Sayas also appeared without the tapis or sobre falda, so embroideries were applied directly on the skirt. In spite of its relative simplicity, most women still insisted on wearing a panuelo up until war broke out in the country. The devastation of World War II brought widespread suffering loss of human lives and damage to the nation. And when it ceased in 1945, a monumental task of rebuilding the country faced Filipinos. The Philippines was also granted independence from the United States, and this, along with the end of World War II, brought about a jubilation which also ushered back the use of the terno. In the West, designer Christian Dior presented a new look as a reaction to the wartime austerity. It was characterized by a tiny wasp waist and a voluminous skirt which required yards and yards of fabric. It then became a template for other designers around the world who sought to erase the painful memories of war with their creations. 
in the Philippines, the most pivotal moment for the Terno was the removal of the panuelo. For decades, it has encased the woman's neck and the liberation of the country was an opportune time for women to discard the panuelo completely. By 1946, the terno was simply a dress with butterfly sleeves. Older generations of Filipinas resisted the move, but the younger set welcomed this new fashion. And one of its main proponents was Ramon Valera, who eventually became National Artist for Fashion. As social activities slowly re-emerged, demands for dresses increased, and a new generation of designers rose to the occasion. One such designer was Salvation Lim, and she created this panuelo lesterno. Together with new fashion designers, she will create ternos in the succeeding decades that will take the Philippine dress to a new design and technical level. Haute couture, or high fashion, was said to have peaked in the late 1940s and 1950s. In the Philippines, this was a very creative period in fashion when we had Ramon Valera, Salvation Lim, and a new batch of designers led by Ben Farales, Pitoy Moreno, and Aureo Alonso. It was a time of experimentation on the gown. But at the same time, designers preserved the original proportions of the terno sleeves. In Europe, Spanish designer Cristobal Balenciaga experimented with shapes like the mermaid silhouette on the left and the bubble on the right. Along with other Western designers, they took haute couture to new heights and produced a variety of shapes. In the Philippines, the bouffant look that was perpetuated by Christian Dior in the late 1940s was adapted to the terno in various ways, such as this bouffant terno on the left that had a stylized tapis. The bouffant wedding terno on the right still retained a panuelo, which many brides still wore for their wedding day. The sheath silhouette was another popular form. It was basically a fitted straight-cut gown. The rather straightforward shape was also given decorative touches like trains and flaps. The mermaid silhouette was fitted close to the bodice, waist, and hips. Then near knee level, it flared out like a fishtail. The mermaid is not the same as the serpentina skirt of the early 1900s. Though both styles have flared bottoms, their upper skirt silhouettes are not the same. In the area of high fashion, the 1950s encouraged an atmosphere of bold experimentation. The fusion of fashion designers and women who reveled in wearing such creations produced some of the most experimental shapes that the Terno had ever seen. The 1950s also saw the transformation of the translucent butterfly sleeves into a solid opaque form. Designers wrapped the sleeves with the same material as the rest of the gown, using the stiff canyamazo as an understructure. By the end of the 1950s, the terno had gone through numerous subtractions that saw the removal of the tapis, sobre falda, saya de cola, and finally the panuelo. By this time, a gown was turned into a terno with the mere addition of butterfly leaves. To a certain extent, the adaptability of the Philippine terno allowed it to weather decades of changes that threatened its survival. It was also a reflection of the Filipino psyche 
and resiliency in the face of hurdles. Today, the last bastion of the Philippine dress lies in a pair of butterfly sleeves. That is why it is important to prevent it from being diminished any further. Because when the sleeves are subjected to further reduction, we simply lose the last remaining essence of the Philippine dress. The gown may come in a variety of forms that we see today, but the terno sleeves need to remain as the constant element. We will now shift to some other forms of Philippine costumes to help us distinguish them from each other. We start with the Balintawak, considered the country version of the terno. The Balintawak was considered the country version of the Philippine terno. It was also used in town fiestas and pilgrimages to Antipolo. It used a soft alampay instead of a stiff panuelo. It peaked in the 1920s and 1930s. And it also evolved in succeeding decades as a one-piece dress and formal attire. Here are the components of the Balintawak. It still had a camisa with butterfly sleeves. It had an alampay, which was a kerchief or square piece of cloth. It had a saya, usually made of simple material like printed cotton. It had a tapis, which was the same material as the alalampay. And finally, to complete the look, women wore bakya or wooden clogs. Other ways of wearing the alampay include following. Using it as a headscarf. Resting it on the neck like a loose kerchief. Here is a clip from the 1955 Pearl of the Orient, a Coca-Cola short film on the Philippines. It features the Balintawa used in Philippine folk dance.
Another type of Philippine costume is a kimona, a variation of the kamisa. The kimona emerged in the 1920s. It primarily used, it or, or rather it was primarily used as house dress or informal wear. It was based on a popular pattern in the 1920s that made use of extended shoulders resembling a Japanese kimono. It also evolved as formal dress in the 1960s. Here is an actual kimono from the Commonwealth period. As you can see, here we have extended sleeves. It's also worn like a pullover garment or like a t-shirt. And it mainly uses husi or pinya or sheer material. By the 1960s, the humble kimona evolved as a more formal attire. The kimona top was normally worn with a draped skirt, which was inspired by the patadyong from the Visayas. Now, Filipiniana attire is an evolving term which goes beyond variations of the terno, balintawak, kimona, and also the barong. It currently encompasses the wealth of Philippine costumes from north to south and modern clothing that take inspiration from these traditional costumes. It also includes contemporary clothes that make use of indigenous fabrics and other local materials. Here are some examples. From the north, these include rich clothing traditions from the Ifugao, Milongot, Itneg, Gadang, and Kalinga. From the south, an incredible wealth of clothing traditions by indigenous groups, some of which include the Bagobo, Bilaan, Manobo, Mandaya, Maranao, Tiboli, Tagabawa, Tagakaulo, Talaandig, and Dayakan. There are also contemporary clothes inspired by traditions of our traditional garment. These garments borrow the weaving, embroidery, and surface decoration techniques that were originally used in more traditional clothing. Finally, Filipiniana has also extended to the use of indigenous materials or textiles such as sinamay, piña, and inabel. These fabrics are fashioned into contemporary silhouettes which usually take inspiration from traditional Philippine costumes. So the next time you are asked to dress in Filipiniana attire, you have a wide array of clothing traditions to choose from aside from the Philippine terno. So thank you for joining us in this three-part session. We hope that you gained a better understanding and appreciation of our clothing traditions. Maraming salamat po.